All right. Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, November 25, 2022. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator, coming to you on a wet and cloudy late autumn evening in my hometown of Rockport, Massachusetts. These Earth and Space Reports are intended to engage and inform people like you who are curious about Earth as a planet, who care about our life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. Video recordings of these reports are archived on the Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. They are also in regular rotation on the 1623 Studios Community Access Cable Television channel. I'm grateful for the continued interest and support shown by Rockport educators and students, Cape Ann cultural colleagues, cohorts of the Gloucester Area Astronomy Club, sundry earth and space scientists and communicators, far-flung friends, family, and other curious folk. Thank you for participating. This evening, I will talk on navigating the cosmos, how astronomers have reckoned sizes and distances from planet Earth to the cosmic web. This talk will be somewhat quantitative, using geometric patterns and trigonometric relations to triangulate many of the salient sizes and distances. There will be plenty of pictures, however, to help vivify all that geometric reckoning. So without any further introductions, I will now share my screen and get to the program. So here we go, share screen, there it is. And come on, hush, 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 hush. Where is the uh, slideshow? Boom. From the beginning. <clears throat> so the fancy title is Navigating the Cosmos, How Astronomers Have Reckoned Sizes and Distances from Planet Earth to the Cosmic Web. And I hope uh, you might recognize uh, the painter of this painting. It's Johannes Vermeer. Um, I believe this is the astronomer. He also did a painting called The Geographer, but I think this is the astronomer. Okay. So let's start off with Earth's shape and size. Uh, back in the day, a uh, long time ago, even before I was born, uh, people thought that the Earth was flat. It was a disc world, uh, similar to a science fiction series uh, that some of you may know about. And it, it, it basically uh, was on top of elephants, which was on top of a tortoise, and then on top of elephants, and then on and on and on down. That's what people thought. But um, it didn't take long for people to come around to the idea that the Earth might not have that flat shape or disc shape. And so we begin with a flat world. If you're, the Earth was flat, your sight lines could extend forever. So um, if you had a strong enough optic, uh, binoculars or telescope, you could see England from New England in principle, if it was a flat world. But we know that that's not true and that distant boats disappear over a thing called the horizon. And that occurs when you have a curved shape for your home planet. And uh, everybody has their own limiting horizon, which depends on um, the size of the planet and Earth in our case, and how far above uh, the surface you are. You know, your limiting horizon gets larger and larger, or greater and greater, farther away uh, as you get higher up. And um, so that is a, an attribute of a curved uh, planet. And uh, it doesn't take much to go from a curvature in one direction to a curvature in all directions, namely a sphere-like uh, object. And um, that was uh, accepted by Eratosthenes, who actually figured out a way to uh, determine the circumference of our planet. And so he noted that in Syene, which is in present day Aswan, that on a particular day, it was the summer solstice, June 21st, on that day at noon, the sun would be directly overhead. It would be at the zenith. And he knew that because you could look down a well 
and uh, you could see the reflection of the sun down at the bottom of the well. But if he went 5,000 5, stadia farther north to Alexandria, um, he, would, he or others would find on the same date and the same time, noon, that the sun was not at the zenith. In fact, it was uh, at an angle that corresponded to 1 50th of a circle. And so he uh, assumed the earth being a sphere. And he said that the circumference of the sphere would be 50 times the distance between Syene and Alexandra. And he came pretty darn close to uh, what we think the circumference of the earth is, 35,000 miles. It all depends on how long a stadium is. <laughs> and it's not clear, but uh, people's best guesses as to what, how long a stadium is uh, leads to a, a pretty good reckoning of the Earth's circumference. Uh, you could do the same thing, uh, especially if you had a friend living in Quebec City. Uh, I do have a friend named Laurent, and um, we could use our smarty pants phones <clears throat> to just be simultaneous. You know, we would call up and say, okay, I'm going to look at the sun and I'm going to measure its angle from the zenith. And I want you to do the same thing at the same time. We, we'd be talking, let's do it now. And uh, you would take those two angles, zenith angles, measure their difference or calculate their difference. And that uh, angular difference could be used to uh, determine the circumference of the entire earth, knowing the distance between Boston and Quebec City, which is I think about 400 miles. Uh, like, wait a second, yeah, 400 miles. And so it's some, I've never done it, but it would be kind of a fun thing to do. But I wanted to do something which was all by myself, something that I could do uh, without having to correspond with somebody in, Quebec City, for example, or, or go as far away as Quebec City. And so um, I kind of backwards engineered it in my mind and came to the conclusion that I could do it by going to Front Beach, which is right here in Rockport, and then eyeballing a piece of the breakwater. So this is a structure that was built at the turn of the ninth, uh, the, basically from the 1800s to the 1900s. Uh, it was going to make uh, Rockport, Sandy Bay, a uh, harbor of refuge for the Navy. And they started building it, but then World War I came along. And after that, uh, the, they decided to give up uh, this task. But they built a fair bit of the, of the breakwater. And there are little bits and pieces on the right-hand side, which are good for spotting. And what you do is you go down into the water holding binoculars. It's quite a sight. Um, and see at that point, what point you no longer see that little spot of land. And knowing um, the height of the water to your eyes, that's one dimension. And knowing the, the dimension here to uh, the little spot of land, you can triangulate uh, the distance uh, to, so, sorry, you can triangulate the radius of the earth. And so the geometry is fairly simple. You'll see it in um, the video I'm going to show. Uh, it's basically you have the earth here and you're at a height above earth. And this is the distance to that piece on the horizon. And you basically have a right triangle. And um, a, a triangle with a 90 degree angle. And um, so uh, from the relationship, uh, which you might recall from high school, the Pythagorean theorem, you can derive the radius of Earth. And so I've done it several years with students <clears throat> and by myself. And the, uh, the errors are typically less than 10%. So it can be done. And so here is the presentation. Let's see if it goes. Here we go. Okay. And we'll start with the conditions. Okay. 
Hello? There's my intrepid daughter, Renee, and she is trying to slot the lump of wood in, which we use to get a beat on our variety. Okay, so that's one. And I, this is the only way I know how to do this. I'm not going to show much of this because uh, the sound sucks. Here's the breakwater. Just pause it. So there's the breakwater. And uh, depending on the tide, you usually have some land which is very, very close to the water line. And that's kind of critical. You want to make sure that you're spotting a piece of land which is just barely above the water line. Okay. So I'm done with that. And here comes. <laughs> so here we have Jasper Williamson, who's in my honors AP class, and he's the only brave soul that came out today. So he's the man, and he's going to go in with the binoculars and find that sweet spot where you can just barely see that lump of land. Thank you, Jasper, in advance. <laughs> All right, so that's that one. Let's do the experiment now. No, remember where that is, but that actually works. You can just figure out the calculations without being there. You don't need the angle. Coming back. Oh. Are we going to keep going? Oh, okay. Okay. Here comes the reckoning. The reckoning. Uh, calculations. When you're ready. That's the girl. In front of the bathroom. Um, so this is where we are. Andy Bay. We're, we were at Front Beach, and um, Jasper uses binoculars to eye a piece of the breakwater, which is submerged at high tide, but we were at mid-tide, and so he was able to uh, see it. Uh, and then he walked into the water until he could no longer see it, uh, and then measured uh, his height of his eyes above the waterline, and uh, that's that's the 
that's this type right here. Here's Earth um, with its radius R. And um, he was a height above the waterline, obviously not drawn to scale. The distance to that lump of land is D. And you can see that this is a right triangle with a 90 degree angle. And so um, this length is the hypotenuse and um, that squared, R plus H squared is equal to the sum of this little R, this R squared plus this D squared, that's your Pythagorean theorem. And you spread this baby out, open it up, uh, and you have R squared you can get rid of. Uh, you can move this H squared over to the other side and then divide by 2H and you end up getting a solution for uh, the radius of Earth equaling the distance to the lump squared minus uh, the height that he, uh, his eyes were above the waterline divided squared. by two times the height. Uh, I worked with this map to figure out what this distance was, and it was around 2.96 kilometers. Uh, so let's do the calculation now for, uh, for Jasper. This is going to be 2.98 times 10 cubed squared minus, what was it, 0 0.65? That was the height, You were. it was near your waist times 0 0.65 and um, we'll see how close we get. Uh, 2.98 squared minus 0 0.65 equals divided by 2 equals divided by 0 0.65 and you end up getting um, basically 6831 kilometers it, it, it's 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 basically 6.83 times 10 to the six meters but that's what you got the nominal equatorial at, the, at least at the equator is six is six three eight seven so let's see how close we got basically uh Six eight three one divided by six three eight seven. So he was good to eleven percent. Hey, on a very bad day. <laughs> and there you have it. So physics in front of the facility. <laughs> yes, yes, in front of the men's room and ladies' room <laughs> at Front Beach. Well, okay. So there you go. Uh, my calculation was that for the error was a little bit off. It was less than 10%, as I recall. Okay, so now I go back to this. Uh, wait a second. Meeting controls. What am I doing? Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. So um, that worked out pretty well. And uh, I did it on much better days. And we could, uh, the error was, you know, consistently less than 10%. So now you have the Earth's size, assuming that it's a sphere. And uh, given that, you can find the moon size by simply observing a lunar eclipse. And that is a wonderful thing to do uh, over a few hours, maybe uh, cocktails at midnight, if depending on what time the lunar eclipse occurs. And here you can see uh, the eclipse occurring, and you can see the shadow of the Earth now cutting into uh, the illuminated moon or the illumination of the moon by the sun. And uh, as it, the eclipse proceeds, you start getting some colors, and that's due to some um, basically some light that's filtering through the Earth's atmosphere and uh, hitting the moon. And uh, the color depends on what's in the atmosphere, like smoke or ash from a volcano, things like that. So here's a picture that was taken by Tom Carboni. I, I don't have the date. I, I can't see what it says, but it was 2015, is that right? Uh, and so you can project this on a screen and 
uh, get a really big compass, like those big uh, plastic compasses which have chalk attached, and you can you can literally figure out what the radius of curvature of of the uh, of the Earth's shadow on the Moon, and uh, you typically find that it's about four times larger than that of the Moon. Uh, the actual, I think, the actual number is three point five seven. Uh, times larger. And so now you know that the moon is 3.57 times smaller than the earth. And so now you have a size for the moon. And uh, you have a linear size for the moon and, and you can figure out the angular size of the moon because it just so happens that the moon and the sun have the same angular size. And that is demonstrated during solar eclipses when the moon blots out the sun like a lid on a jar. And so that's kind of a cool thing because the sun's angular diameter is, is very easy to determine. You basically create a pinhole camera, uh, let's say a piece of tin foil at a distance, say a, a, a meter using a meter stick and then um, uh, some paper to project uh, the image of the sun through the pinhole onto a piece of paper. And you can measure the size of the paper, relate this, uh, the size of the uh, image of the sun on the paper uh, and then take the ratio of that size to the meter, you know, your, uh, your throw, your lever arm, and that gives you the angle of the sun. And um, it turns out to be about a half a degree. I think it's actually 0.53 degrees. But once you have that, um, you can um, use the angular and the actual linear size of the moon uh, to calculate the distance to the moon. Uh, because with an angle and one dimension, you can always get the other dimension. And uh, that's basically the bottom line for this sort of geometric reckoning. And here is uh, basically the uh, situation. Here's the earth right here, and there's the moon. They are to scale. And uh, this is the height of a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, you can you cannot even see the space station. It would be, you know, just like 200 kilometers above, 300 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is where Apollo 13 uh, suffered a tank explosion. That's why it was such a problem uh, because they were pretty much at the moon, uh, but they had to abort that and come back. And uh, so that was a, a scary situation. Okay. Alternatively, which is something that can be done uh, another way, is to look at the location of the fully eclipsed moon relative to background stars. Okay. And because depending on where you are on Earth's planet, on the planet Earth, uh, the position of the eclipsed moon will change with respect to the background stars. And so I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but I see this, this, these two stars right here. And that helped me get a bead on where the moon's location was. Those, those two stars and these two stars, which I know you can barely see them. And um, I want to note that E. Simon uh, took this shot uh, very recently, <laughs> recent lunar eclipse. So here is another picture. Uh, of the eclipsed moon at this time, November 8th. And here are those two little stars. And here's the other two stars. The moon has obviously moved, <clears throat> appeared to move with respect to the background stars. And that's because uh, you're looking at it from two different places, basically opposite sides of the earth. And um, also uh, the, the, the view is, is rotated and that's to be expected considering that you're um, one of them was looking towards uh, close to sunrise that was here in Massachusetts and they were looking at the moon close to sunset. And I'm sorry, this uh, keeps changing. I can't fix it. Um, but, but the basic geometry is you have the earth and with its radius here and the moon just uh, represented as a point 
And this was the observation from Massachusetts, and this was the observation from Japan. And uh, you can triangulate the distance, right? You, you, you find out what the uh, difference in angle is based on uh, where the moon was with respect to the background stars. And then you can get this angle, you know this angle, and you know the, the radius of Earth, and you know this angle because that's the difference between these, um, uh, these longitudes on Earth. And so the first relationship is um, getting S divided by R, which is the sine of this angle. And from that, you can determine S. And then once you have S here, S over D is the tangent of this angle. And from that, you can determine the distance. And so I did this, I'm sorry, uh, it's horizontal format, but I ended up getting 396,000 kilometers with uh, uh, Eves' uh, observations and the fellow from Japan. And that is within a 3% error of the nominal value of 384,000 kilometers to the moon. So uh, I would love to say that this work, worked out great, of course, but um, maybe we were just lucky. <laughs> okay, so now we've gone to the moon, distance to the moon, the size of the moon. And um, now what about the distance to the sun? Well, Aristarchus, around 220 BC, he noted that the time between third quarter phase and first quarter phase was less than a half a month. And so he that suggested to him that they weren't at 180 degrees from one another, okay? And so based on the time that he determined compared to a full month, which is uh, 29 days, um, he ended up getting an angle. Uh, I don't know whether it was this 63.7 degree angle, but he, he got some angle, uh, which then could be worked gym geometrically, he used a different kind of uh, reckoning than trigonometry to get the Earth's sun distance. And um, it was much shorter than what we know today, but it was enough for him to realize that the, the sun is very far away and therefore it must be really huge in actuality. Uh, and that idea that the sun rules overall. And um, this finding was basically ignored for the next 1500 years. <laughs> uh, he was not as good a promoter of his work as Eratosthenes was. And um, so 1500 years later, well, actually uh, Copernicus proposed a sun-centered solar system, but the actual measurements determining the distance to the sun occurred during the 1700s and 1800s, where you get these pairs of transits of Venus in front of the sun. So here, uh, here's uh, Venus transiting the sun as seen in Velsheim, Germany. And here's the same transit that occurred, I think in 2008, uh, as observed in Udaipur, India. And it turns out that they are slightly displaced uh, with respect to the center of the sun by a fraction of the, um, of the uh, uh, basically the transiting uh, planet. It, it, it's, it, it's a small dimension. I worked it out in a, in a workshop with educators and um, we worked with this uh, kind of geometry. Again, triangles, triangles. Um, here, we are in Velsheim, Germany. Here we are in Udaipur, India, uh, with known distance between those two places. And um, here's the, whoops, sorry. Here's the angle, uh, basically the shifted angle, that uh, half of the shifted angle that is observed. You have a dimension, you have an angle, and you can get this dimension, the distance between Venus and Earth. And uh, Copernicus had already worked out that Venus was 0.7, uh, the distance to the sun from Earth. 
And so you could work out uh, the entire distance from the, uh, from the earth to, to the sun. And, and it worked out fairly well. This is a very important dimension. It's uh, called the astronomical unit. And as an example, uh, Jupiter has a distance of 5.2 astronomical units from the sun. So who was able to figure that out? Uh, it was Nikolai Copernicus who worked out uh, in the 1500s, the relative distances of the planets. Uh, the transits hadn't yet occurred or been observed uh, satisfactorily. And um, here's his heliocentric model. You might notice that there are not as many planets as uh, we have today, but that's because they stopped at Saturn. Uh, Uranus and Neptune hadn't been observed yet, hadn't been discovered. And so for the inner planets, these are the planets interior to the Earth's orbit, you can use this thing called greatest elongation. It's an angle of greatest elongation. As the inner planet goes around, basically laps the orbit of Earth, laps Earth, uh, like on, on, a, on a racetrack, um, it, it goes close to the sun, and then it gets maximally far from the sun at this point. It's a tangent to the circle and you can measure that angle. Uh, and so for uh, Mercury, it's only um, 28 degrees and that gives you a distance of 0.4 astronomical units. And for Venus, uh, it's around 47 degrees and that gives you uh, a distance of 0.7 astronomical units, which I, which I mentioned before. So that's what you can do with the planets interior to the sun. Exterior to the sun, uh, sorry, exterior to Earth, um, Earth's orbit, uh, there were two known planets. There was Jupiter and Saturn, and, and Copernicus was able to figure out their relative distances compared to that of the Earth-Sun distance by considering certain apparitions of the planets. Uh, one of them is opposition. That's when Earth and the planet are closest to one another. That's when the planet is observed highest in the sky at midnight. The other apparition is quadrature, and that's when the planet is highest in the sky at either sunrise or sunset, okay? And the time between the quadrature and opposition uh, can be found in any astrologer's ephemerides charts, uh, that time compared to the time between opposition and opposition, or it should be opposition and then Earth always laps the outer planet and opposition, uh, that, that ratio of times uh, multiplied by 360 degrees gives you this, this precious angle here. Um, and from that, you now have an angle. Uh, we say that uh, it, the Earth's sun distance is one astronomical unit. And so then you can get this other dimension. And I've actually done this because I was curious. I wanted to see if it would work and, and it worked. <laughs> it was pretty neat. All right, so we've pretty much done the solar system, uh, reckoning uh, distances and sizes. Uh, stars are another thing. And um, this, was attempted for hundreds of years, uh, going back to Galileo in the 1600s, perhaps even earlier. Uh, the idea is that if Earth is actually not in the center of the solar system, but is actually orbiting the sun, then it, it, it spans out its own baseline. You know, uh, the perspective changes. And um, what, what you'll see is that nearby stars will appear to be located in different parts of the sky, you know, rel uh, relative to more distant stars, background stars. And so if you can observe at one time of the year and then observe basically a half a year later, knowing that the Earth-Sun distance is one astronomical union, unit, uh, or 150 million kilometers, uh, you can take this angle, this shifted angle, or half of the shifted angle, it's known as a parallax angle. You have an angle, 
you have a dimension and you can get the distance to the nearest stars. And it turns out that it's really hard to do. Uh, the nearest star is not one, does not produce one degree shifts. It doesn't produce one tenth of a degree shifts. It doesn't produce one hundredth of a degree shifts. It doesn't even produce one one thousandth of a degree shift. It's about one three thousandth of a degree shift. And that had to, uh, that required really fancy telescope, the best telescope at, uh, available at the time. And it was achieved by Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel in 1880. Um, and that was amazing because it did two things. It showed that the earth is moving. It's the earth that moves and not the sun. So the earth is not at the center of the system, the sun is. And then it also showed that these, these stars are really far away. And so they are distant suns. You know, they're as powerful as uh, the sun is. So this, this enabled to start making maps. It's, it's enabled us to map out the distribution of stars closest to the sun. So this is like a, a, a radius out to about 15 light years. And there's the sun, there's Alpha Centauri, which is uh, basically the nearest naked eye star in the sky. And then there's Proxima Centauri, which is part of that system. And then there's Sirius, which you might've heard of. And then there's Procyon, which has got the best name ever in the sky. Procyon. Um, but the other ones you would not know. You know, most of you would not know. Maybe, uh, maybe astronomers among you might have heard of Barnard Star. And there's 61 Cygni, which is what uh, Bessel found. And if you're a sci-fi fan, you might know Tau Ceti. But basically, uh, most of these stars you would not know. And that's because they're dim red bulbs. They require telescopes to uh, actually be detected. So there you go. Going out farther, 25 light years, uh, re reveals a lot more red and dim stars mostly. And um, I'm not gonna try to find stars you might know. If you can see that there's a lot of stars that you, you don't know. And that's, it's because the meek have inherited the, the galaxy, okay? All right. And 250 light years from the sun, we're pretty much at the limit or were at the limit of the parallax method. It has gotten better with this mm -hmm. Gaia uh, satellite, which is out there measuring distances, hopefully to a billion stars in the galaxy. So, but this, this was, I guess you could say this is pre-Gaia. <clears throat> and you don't see much of a pattern there, do you? Uh, in the distribution. But wait, if you go a little farther, and start typecasting the stars. And this is uh, what you can do with those stars. You now know their distances. And so you know how apparently bright they are. Knowing their distances, you can figure out their absolute luminosities, how, you know, what they really are putting out in terms of um, how much brighter they are compared to the sun. This would be a solar luminosity, 100 solar luminosities. 100,000 uh, solar luminosities. And the same thing in the parlance of magnitudes, which goes back to uh, ancient Greek times. What you find is that there's this family of stars uh, with the main sequence and the giants and the white dwarfs. And these are all stars whose distances have been measured using this uh, parallax uh, routine. And you can start pipe casting stars, which is very helpful because then if you have a cluster of stars, say the Pleiades, the seven sisters, uh, you can basically get their, their, their absolute magnitudes and their temperatures and plot them up and compare them with the main sequence uh, of the fiducial uh, stars. And it's this, this difference in absolute magnitudes between the absolute magnitude and the apparent magnitude, which gives you the distance modulus which is distance dependent. And from that, you can get um, a distance for the Pleiades of 138 parsecs or about 500 light years. So um, uh, these clusters are great because you know all the stars are at the same distance. They're part of a cluster. Uh, so yay, good stuff. And with that information, they've mapped out uh, what clusters are 
basically within within 4,000 light years of the sun. Where's the sun? Is it in the crosshairs? Yes. And um, in addition to the clusters, which are in blue, uh, you also have uh, nebulae, uh, which uh, some of your amateur astronomers might know, the Orion Nebula, many of you might know. And um, with all this information, there seems to be a peppering of stars um, which have bands. There's a band of stars here, and a band of stars here, and a band of stars here. And that's some of the best evidence we have for spiral structure in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, I'm sorry it's not as neat as you might like it, but that's what the data show. <laughs> All right, so by tight casting stars, not in clusters and in clusters, but observing them in the infrared where you can cut through the dust better, you can go beyond a radius of 4,000 uh, light years to basically map out the galaxy or, or what might be uh, how the galaxy looks. And the first thing to note is that there's, the galaxy has a bar. The sun is located here and there seems to be this elongated structure of yellowish stars. Um, and it's surrounded by a disk which sports spiral structure um, consisting of uh, bluish stars and uh, reddish nebulae and um, what else? Dust, of course, uh, dust which is tracing the gas clouds that made these bluish stars not too long ago. So basically the spiral arms show where star formation is ongoing. Some people say that it's a two-arm spiral. Other astronomers say that it's a four-arm spiral. And uh, who knows, they both might be right, depending on the tracers that they use. So uh, this, this is... I would say this is still speculative. But the I would also say that the, the bar is pretty well stitched down. Okay, to go even deeper, uh, you need new ways of uh, referencing your distances. And um, this has to do with a particular type of star. It's a Cepheid variable. They were found in, uh, they're, they're supergiant stars. Uh, they were found in the Milky Way. For example, the, uh, the namesake uh, is Delta Cephei. It's a particular star in the constellation of Cepheus. And its light, it, light output undergoes oscillations. It gets bright and then dim and then bright in kind of a sawtooth fashion. And this one, I think, is uh, on the order of about four or five days, the period from uh, peak to peak. And what Henrietta Leavitt discovered by observing the small Magellanic cloud, she basically used photographs that had been taken of this, uh, we now know it's a, a dwarf companion galaxy, uh, from the south, southern hemisphere, the, these deep plates. She examined them and found the variable stars. So you have to have plates upon plates upon plates over time. She found the variable stars. She presumed that they were all at the same distance, the distance of the small Magellanic cloud. And she found a relationship between the period of oscillation and the brightness, okay? Uh, and since they were all at the same distance, um, the apparent brightness is indicative of the absolute brightness. It's a good proxy for the absolute brightness. And um, basically what she found was this beautiful relationship between period and luminosity and that has made all the difference because now you can look at more distant galaxies, find variable stars, uh, determine their period of uh, oscillation, period of variability, and then just kind of read off what their luminosity is. Once you know the absolute luminosity and measure the apparent luminosity, the apparent brightness, then you can figure out that distance modulus and the distance. And that got us outside of the Milky Way. It allowed us to determine that there were other galaxies. And um, beginning with the Sagittarius dwarf, the large and small Magellanic cloud. So this is our, basically the local group of uh, thugs, I mean galaxies. 
and um, we are, this is just what's around the Milky Way, and we are part of a, uh, as I said, the local group, which is dominated by both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy with its own coterie of dwarf galaxies, and then some itinerant galaxies like the M33, the Triangulum galaxy, and various other dwarf galaxies. And it all adds up to about 40 or so uh, galaxies in this local group. And I just want to note that Milky, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy uh, seem to be headed towards one another. Um, they seem to be in spiraling towards one another. And um, the merger might occur 4 billion years from now. So uh, don't wait up. Again, using the Cepheid variables, you can go out even farther uh, to see that there are other groups and even clusters. Clusters are bigger than groups. So here you have the local group and uh, the dominant cluster here is the Virgo cluster in the direction of Virgo, the constellation of Virgo. And all of these groups and clusters are now known to be part of the Virgo supercluster. And uh, it's, it's kind of a ratty system, uh, but uh, now we're talking about tens of millions of light years. So if that's 10 million light years, this is, or is this uh, 20, 30, 30, this might be 30, 40, 50, 50 million light years uh, in radius. So it's a, it's a pretty big piece of real estate. So what have we done? This is just kind of a recap. Uh, nowadays, if you want to get distances, reliable distances to planets, at least the inner planets of Mercury, Venus, and Mars with rocky surfaces, you use radar, radar ranging. You, you, you um, send a radio signal uh, toward the planet and wait for the return signal uh, and that time difference times the speed of light will give you twice the distance. So divide by two, and that'll get you the distance to the planet. And that's probably the best way to determine distances to planets nowadays. For stars, parallax remains the best way to determine distances, the, the, that angle based on uh, the time of year you observe uh, nearby stars with respect to background stars. Uh, then there is this main sequence fitting. You, 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 you use um, uh, the, the sequence of brightness versus temperature and compare it to something either of a known distance or that, uh, that plot that I showed, you know, it was basically a, a fiducial uh, version of the same main sequence and you can get that distance modulus and hence the distance. Uh, but if you wanna go beyond the Milky Way galaxy, you need this period luminosity relationship, which uh, the Cepheids uh, provided. And that uh, was, has been used as part of the Hubble, one of the Hubble key projects to get distances out, I think beyond the Virgo cluster. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you need other standard candles and uh, the best uh, are these white dwarfs, which go supernovae. Um, why are they so good? Uh, basically, you have a white dwarf, which is in a um, binary uh, system with another star. The star starts um, evolving. Uh, white dwarf has already evolved uh, into a compact object, the star that was bef uh, the white, uh, before the white dwarf. But now the uh, companion evolves, it, it turns into a red giant and um, its matter starts spilling into the white dwarf, uh, raising its mass to a crucial uh, value, 1.44 times that of the sun, the so-called Chandrasekhar mass. And then all of a sudden uh, the, the star uh, can no, the white dwarf can no longer handle it. And you get a big, big explosion and since it's always right around at that 1.44 solar masses, it obliterates all of that in a, in a supernova. 
and it's the same mass exploding. And so it produces typically the same luminosity. Again, you got the luminosity, the apparent brightness, compare them, you got a distance. So here's the original, well, sorry. So the last thing you do is you find that with distance, galaxies, uh, their light gets redshifted. And we can see it precisely using spectra and certain spectral lines that are emitted by these galaxies, by those nebulae, those red nebulae. And you see how it's been shifted compared to uh, the laboratory value of wavelength. And that gives you a value uh, for the uh, recession velocity. It's, it's kind of like a Doppler effect. And this is what Hubble, Edwin Hubble plotted in 1929. He plotted the recession velocities from spectra that were taken, uh, I think by other people. And um, he had various ways of guessing the distances to the, to the galaxies that he was considering. And he found a relationship. And he had the genius to realize that that was indicative of a universally expanding universe of galaxies. I guess I used universe twice, sorry. A, an expanding universe of galaxies. It's known as universal expansion. And um, so pretty darn good, Edwin Hubble. Nowadays, that region right there in, in the red is basically his, that was his sample of galaxies in that little red square. And since then, uh, astronomers have used these uh, type 1a supernovae, these exploding white dwarfs in distant galaxies uh, to determine distances. And then um, separately, you have to uh, take a spectrum and find uh, the, um, the rate of expansion and they get this relationship. And that the slope of that relationship is known as the Hubble constant, uh, which tells you how fast the universe is expanding. And you can turn this around again. You can look at galaxies that you don't know their distances. They don't have supernovae popping off. Uh, but you can measure the velocity and then basically uh, uh, go to the curve and determine their distances. And now we're getting distances out to more than a billion light years, not too shabby. Right. So we're near the end here. Um, using this method of taking spectra of galaxies and um, finding their red shifts, uh, the red shifts and wavelengths, um, they've determined distances and they've pieced together what has been called the cosmic web. And it, it's kind of ratty. And um, it consists of uh, s some things which have been called walls. Uh, and of course, there's lots of super clusters. Those are at the nodes of these webs. And there's lots of big voids as well. Um, and we don't really know what to make of it, except that in projection on the sky, it's very similar to the modeling that one sees in the cosmic microwave background. So it suggests that the, the structuring of the universe on the largest scales was preordained, already uh, determined by the quantum fluctuations inherent to the cosmic microwave background. So I know that's trippy stuff, but uh, at the least, this is what you can do when you uh, pay attention to uh, deriving distances. You can also start looking uh, at evolution, how the universe has evolved over cosmic time, because the farther away you look, the farther away an object is, the more distant in time in the past you're seeing that object, because it takes a while for the light to get from the source to us. <clears throat> and if it's uh, a billion or so light years away, we're seeing it as it was a billion years ago. And um, we've now been able to see objects that are 12 billion light years away, or, you know, the, their light was emitted 12 billion years ago. So we're seeing, you know, galaxies in their youth, and they, they look different than what they, uh, the galaxies look like at today. These little green squares here are, are the galaxies that are shown here. 
and um, they're typically red, and that's because their light has been red shifted, and um, they look kind of irregular. So I like to call them little red turds at the edge of infinity, um, but I don't think that's a classification system. I don't think it's going to make one. So anyway, uh, we're now at the edge of the visible universe, and the James Webb Space Telescope will could get us even uh, further, farther, and uh, we might be able to get more reliable structures regarding these uh, these little motes of light. So the most distant source of light is regarded as the cosmic microwave background, which I said that all this modeling um, is consistent with the um, cosmic web and so might be uh, a fingerprint of the structuring of the universe on the largest scales. But we're looking back to an epoch uh, of radiation that uh, was sent out 13.8 billion years ago, only, um, oh gosh, um, 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And um, yeah, as I noted, the, the one degree, these blobs have characteristic uh, separations of about a, a degree on the sky. And that's consistent with two things, that the universe is flat in topology, that uh, it's, you know, it, it bring down the dimensionality, it's more like a flat sheet of paper than a curved saddle or the surface of a sphere. And uh, so we think that's true. And it's also indicative of uh, the, the clustering that went on on a submicroscopic level uh, early on in the universe, which has since expanded to produce the, uh, the clustering of galaxies that we see today. Good stuff. And all that um, harks back to this modest experiment off of Front Beach. So. Uh, it's a long, strange trip, but I'm glad to be a par small part of it. And I thank you for paying attention. And I also want to note that more cosmic fathoming uh, through space and time can be found in my new book, Just in Time for Your Holiday Shopping. And um, it's available as a paperback and an ebook, and soon an audiobook. Uh, it's going to be narrated by a very, or is being narrated by a very erudite British actor, uh, which kind of adds a whole new flavor to the book. <laughs> I look forward to that. So anyway, thank you. I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then ask if any of you have any questions. Bill, you should hold off for Morgan Freeman. Oh, I don't know. This guy, he, apparently he did a Harry Potter tour. And I heard a snippet. They allowed me a snippet. And it was incredible. <laughs> Much better than I could do. Yeah. Morgan. Great presentation, oh, I... Bill. Thank you. OK, good. Thank you, Phil. Um, Bill, I did want to add about the color of the moon. Yeah. Um, what I like to tell people is that you're looking at um, all the sunrises and all the sunsets all around the globe, all at once. That's beautiful. Isn't that mm -hmm. lovely? Mm -hmm. yeah. Bill? Yeah, Dick. Um, can you, enjoyed your presentation on parallax. Could you say something about Hipparchos 1 and 2 the satellites that are doing this and how they've improved our measurement precision? Uh, first off, Dick, I did not know that there were two of them. So uh, thank you for letting me know. Uh, they were in the 90s, I believe. And they got us out to about 250 light years out. I think they that's what they did. They got about 4,000 stars, as I recall. And that, that diagram relating temperatures and luminosities, a large part of those points are based on Hipparchus data. But now Gaia is just going crazy. It's, it's going to outdo Hipparchus, I think, by a lot.
there remain systematic, there's controversies having to do with systematic errors. Uh, it all goes back to the distance of the Hyades, uh, this one cluster, which is in, in the snoot of Taurus the bull. And um, because that cluster provides the basis, provides the fiducial distances. And um, I hope that Gaia and Hipparchus end up being on the same side of history. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't seen a, a Hertzsprung Russell diagram, that's what it's called, uh, based on Gaia data yet. But it's prob they're probably out there and loaded with stars. So I want to note that uh, we have Chuck here, who uh, had me as a, a teaching assistant. I taught a, an astronomy class at the University of Massachusetts a billion years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And um, what was your reaction that you voiced to your then girlfriend? You really want me to say that in this forum? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I came home after a class where you were had expounded, you know, in some, you, you were making some analogy about, I think it was the silver surfer or something flying around the galaxy. And I came home and I just said, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that this guy has done a ton of acid. Is it true? It's, it's easy to reach that conclusion with this subject matter. Yeah, and you know, I, I must say, as I, as I was listening to, to this tonight, it was uh, particularly when you started getting further and further out uh, into clusters of galaxies and so forth. All you know, all was going through my head is why is he why is he saying all this? He can just play Eric Idle's "The Galaxy" song, and oh, we man. got this, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's still good. It's still good. It was mid eighties. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a reason for us to still be existing, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's 8.08. Um, I guess I'll, I'll call this uh, to uh, an end. And uh, thank you again for uh, sticking around and um, uh, spending your post Thanksgiving with me. And I'll send out the recording soon. Okay, great. Our pleasure. Right, excellent. Thanks so much, Bill. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Interesting.